Good evening. The siren song of the black face in the high place. And uh, Glenn already touched on this. I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but I will mention one thing. Before he was elected, black people identified with international struggle. We didn't believe what we were told about wars and interventions. And when we were told that foreign leaders were, uh, particular leaders were enemies or adversaries, we assumed that those targets were worthy of our admiration. If no one in the United States supported Fidel Castro, black people did. Right. Right. There was no question right. among black people that the Vietnam War was wrong and the struggle of those people was just. When Ronald Reagan attempted to kill Muammar Gaddafi, it was black people who condemned the act. But Gaddafi was eventually killed by an American president, and it wasn't by a Republican. Uh -oh. The killing came at the hands of a Democrat, the black one, Ouch. initials B and O. And the only thing more shameful than the US and NATO attack on Libya was the eerie silence from our community about this war of aggression. The voices of condemnation were too few. Most of us had chosen to defend the, that face in a high place instead of the people whose country was destroyed. And that whole sorry episode tells us why we need the Black Alliance for Peace. That's right. Why we need a black-led, people-centered movement, one that won't shrink from doing what King did on this day in 1967, when he publicly expressed his opposition to the Vietnam War. And he was not praised. He was condemned by the media and by short-sighted and opportunistic people in his inner circle. The New York Times and the Washington Post and others of that ilk were blunt. They said he didn't have a right to speak about international issues. He should have stayed in his lane and talked about civil rights. But King knew he had to talk about all of it. That's right. About the public money spent on war instead of human needs, mm -hmm. and about the wrongdoing committed by this government yes. when it acted as the greatest purveyor, purveyor of violence in the world. At BAP now, we attempt to follow in those footsteps. We march against war and US and NATO foreign military bases. We also protest police murder and all violence carried out by the state whether within our borders or in Syria or Somalia. Like King, we declare a right, an obligation, to speak to all of these issues. And to our friends in the peace movement, we make clear that there is a necessity for a black-led movement in those ranks. Because not all of us were bamboozled by Obama and others. We have a unique stance because of our history, and we bring that with us in all that we do. Our movement could be stronger. Our numbers are not what any of us want. But we can change this by speaking to the issues yes. that impact our people. The perspective of people who face racism in all of its forms yes. is desperately needed. And our friends should welcome this leadership. A couple of days ago, I, um, I had an interesting experience on social media, which I'm addicted to, I admit. Oh. <laughs> and um, I was on Twitter. And uh, I responded to uh, this actress, Maria Conchito Alonso, who's Venezuelan, and who's an anti-Maduro person. And she tweeted, imagine hospitals with no electricity or water, food and medicine rotting. We need military intervention now. That's an actual hashtag on the part of uh, those forces, hashtag military intervention now. And I, was, I usually don't. When I see things that I think are crazy, I usually let them pass. But I chose to answer. And I said, Venezuela needs an end to sanctions. And Guaido must stop the sabotage of the electrical system. Do you want war? Do you want people to die? And I got a response from one of her supporters. And he said, I'll cut it short. I'll cut to the chase. He said, quote, Ignorance like you better keep shining shoes. Now, nobody said anything about shining shoes, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that is a response that a white person or any non-black person would never get. And I, I, I raise this issue, I, I relate this story, because that is part of my lived experience. And uh, that remark was obviously clearly racist. And so I didn't need to read about a racial divide in Venezuela, <laughs> about support or opposition to the government. My eyes and my common sense tell me where 
those people stand and where I should stand. So this is a moment which proves the need for the Black Alliance for Peace. And uh, you can uh, see that um, our sign says, no compromise, no retreat. Defeat the war against Africans, black people in the US and abroad. And this war is waged against us all over the world by the 1033 program, which sends millet surplus military equipment to police departments all over the country. So little one horse towns have armored vehicles. And it may look silly and ridiculous, but this is deadly serious on the part of our government, uh, including members of the Congressional Black Caucus, wow. who voted to, most of whom voted to approve this program. And there's a very direct connection between people wearing military uniforms or people wearing uh, police uniform whose job is to uh, keep us under physical control or to kill if they should choose to. And it's also important to think about why we're needed as we begin this spectacle of a presidential election, which is less than a, about a year away. And we're always told to forget about foreign policy and support a candidate who's on the right side of domestic issues, because that's the best we're going to get. And we should make do with Democrats who make mealy mouth statements about uh, opposing military in intervention in Venezuela. And you notice how they say it. I'm against military intervention in Venezuela. They're not against sanctions. They're not against uh, anything else that could overthrow that government. And uh, they may even repeat the talking points of Trump and Pompeo and Bolton. Maduro's a murderous dictator, he's a brutal dictator, he's really evil, but I, I don't want military intervention. And, um, but we have to ignore that. And we have to do that every four years. We have to do it all the time. Because 51 years ago, Dr. King was told the same thing. He should be happy with Lyndon Johnson's largesse, and he should keep his opinions about foreign policy to himself. So if we claim to revere him on this anniversary, every April 4th, as uh, so many people say that they do, we certainly can do no less. We can certainly do no less than to speak up and to say that we are going to talk about peace, we're going to talk about war, and we're going to make the connections between justice here and justice abroad. Thank you very much. Yeah. community-based power in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and so we, we always say the struggle, that what we're struggling for is not a fight against racism. Right. It's a fight for power. That's right. That's right. So Kwame Ture used to say, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If a white man has the power to lynch me, then that's my problem. That's right. So we not, you know, we can't do anything about whatever kind of racist, you know, mentalities and problem things floating around white people's head. But we can do something about the power, the dispositions uh -oh. of power. We we have that's what we're fighting for. That's we're right. a proud member of the Black Alliance for Peace, um, and one of our main campaigns in Washington D.C. is community control over police. <laughs> Now let's be clear, sometimes we say that people think we're fighting for a review board or an oversight. That's not what we fight for. Right. Community control over police is what we fight for. Everything else is redundant. So I'm on the coordinating committee of Black Alliance for Peace as well. Paco, did I say Paco was a member of the Black Alliance for Peace? And um, I'm with, with Margaret, we're co-coordinators of the, of the Africa uh, team. And the Africa team leads up our Shut Down Africa campaign, which you heard a little bit about, and I'm going to talk about the Shut Down Africa campaign. 
um, and but first I'm going to read what our definition of AFRICOM is. AFRICOM is the U.S. is the acronym for the U.S. Africa Command, a more formalized and coordinated U.S. military presence in Africa to carry out long-term geopolitical strategies for U.S. imperialism on the resource-rich continent. AFRICOM is the recolonization of Africa by the U.S. and is the enforcement of it of its part in the new scramble for Africa under the false guise of combating terrorism and dispensing aid. Today there are 46 various forms of U.S. bases as well as military, military to military relations between 53 out of 40, 54 African countries and the United States. U.S. Special Forces troops now operate in more than a dozen African nations. When AFRICOM started about 10 years ago, the African people on the continent didn't want it. Right. People were up in arms. And I think people mentioned it. That was under George W. Bush. In fact, the only country that even entertained, they were trying to find a headquarters for AFRICOM. Now it's, it's in Stuttgart, Germany, because they couldn't find any country except for Liberia was willing to entertain that. You know. But they still ended up, but that's just the, that's, that's what we call the Comprador class. Not the people, the people right. didn't want it. So they ended up not being there. Right? And then comes Obama. That was in 2008. Right after George Bush, right after they established it, Obama came into office, and next thing you know, the Comprador class and all the people, some even some of the people, Obama came into office up until now, we've seen a 1900% increase in the presence of U.S. Uh, military bases and presence in, on the continent of Africa. And one of the things, there was a, uh, a crazy article that came on uh, not too long ago, it was about, it was in the Washington Post, it was this week, I think it was this week, no, maybe it was last week, the, the title of it was, Trump says ISIS is defeated, but West Africa, there are fears of extremism will get worse. And if you read the article, it's describing how the, the leadership and the president of, of, of Mali was saying, please don't, we have this uh, ISIS problem, and these terrorist problems in our country, and if you leave the military, leave, you know, don't, don't stop, you know, we need you over here. Now, this is ridiculously crazy because the problem that they had in the Sahel of Africa, in terms of the, what we call the proliferation of, of of Islamic, what's referred to as Islamic extremism, is a direct result of the United States policy in Africa. Hello. So they caused it, right? And then they want to, and the Comprador class, because the people on the ground never agree with this. I mean, I just keep using that word. People understand what that means. That's the people who are operating for foreign interests. They're supposed to be of another, of a particular country, but they operate for some other interest in your country. We call them traitors. You know? In South Africa, they call them people that was do a necklace. Yeah. People know what the necklace is. Yeah, the necklace The necklace was, in, and this was under apartheid in South Africa, was what they gave to the traders. They would take a tire and douse it in gasoline and put it around the person and light it on fire. It was a necklace, and it was for the traders, the people who collaborated with apartheid in South Africa. Right. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so anyway, um, the responsible for the weakened state is the uh, is U.S. policy in Iraq and Syria, and what they did in, in Libya was sort of what we call a, a beat, like beating a hornet's nest, and they just you know. These are the people they supported in Libya, the, the Islamic extremists, or you know the people that wanted to wanted to take over um, <coughs> Libya, and now they're and also Syria and all that, and now they're all over Africa, and now African leaders are begging the United States to come in and help them with this issue, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So Africom is posed as this humane military solution for problems that the United States. Uh, created itself, and we have to France. The uh, the history of Mali includes France, and and now we have to remember the history. Kwame, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Malcolm X said of all of the, um, this is a paraphrase. Academic disciplines, history is best qualified to reward all research. It means we can't forget. We got to know what happened. So back when when France and when during, during the independence movements in France and Britain and all them and in the United States. When our countries were getting their independence and liberation, these countries were trying to undermine it. That's right. At the same time, COINTELPRO was going on here, 
and they were trying to do everything they could to repress the Black Panther Party and the American Indian Movement and everything. The FBI had the Cointel Pro program. The CIA was in Africa doing the exact same thing. That's right. That's right. We got to remember that. How can they come now and pretend to be some benevolent provider of justice and democracy and fighting terrorism? You know, we gotta remember that. Sometimes they hoodwink us, and so we have to remember these this kind of history. Now, the neo-colonialist puppets, the bankrupt comprador class, they could address the problems in their countries because it's not about Islamic extremism. I mean, the, when you read the, uh, the Washington Post article, it admits this is about land and. Limited resources. That's it's right. not just a slim. And the bankrupt comprador class, they could do something with that. They could just not abide by neoliberal policies. They could do some programs that would more equitably distribute um, resources and land and all that kind of stuff, but they don't want to do that. Right? And of course, they would become uh, targets of the West. That's what they do when, when you start doing stuff for your people, then they make you a target. And so some people would say, well, that's an excuse. Uh, I mean, that would be an excuse for the people to say why they can't do anything for their people, but we got leaders that die for our freedom. Exactly. Mm. I mean, if, if you're not, if you didn't become in a leadership worthy to stand up for your people and do whatever it takes, what good are you? That's right. Michael X said the price of freedom is death. Right. So we got to be ready to stand up and fight and die. And if we're talking about a liberation struggle, those who understood the need for armed struggle said sometimes we got to kill. It's just that cold blooded brothers well, and sisters. Well, well, so, I mean, yes, it is. Well, yeah, well, that's just the way it is. So now I want to talk. I want to finish this because I could go off because we, now there's talk now because this is how they confuse us. Always when what comes with military power is the soft power, and they use NGOs and NGOism. Some of us talk about to kind of confuse and muddy the waters. This is what happened since the, uh, the independence movement and even in here NGOism. We'll hear talk about the international community, even the media. What do they mean when they say the international community? They're not talking about the masses of our people. You know, when they say, what does the international community want? Now, we have countries like the USA, for, uh, USAID, US Agency for International Development, and then through AFRICOM, it's called the carrot and the stick method, that it'll be the, the troops providing, uh, you, know, you know, little uh, rice and all that kind of stuff. Not stuff that's going to help us grow and diversify right. our crops and our, you know, the things that we need to sustain us, just little crumbs to keep us dependent. And they'll have the military doing it so that people will say, we got to, when we say we got to pull U.S. out of Africa, they say, but well, wait a minute. When, when, uh, when like the herd, the cyclone comes and all that kind of stuff, they're going to think we need these forces to help us mitigate problems like that. We gotta be, and they'll come to our sisters and brothers who are in college and entice us with jobs, U.S. Agency for International Development, and we're going on thinking we're doing something for our people, and we just all we're doing is facilitate neocolonialism. That's right. I mean, that's and Kwame Nkrumah talks about neocolonialism. He describes it in a book called Neocolonialism: The Last Stage of Imperialism. One of the chapters is called The Mechanations of Neocolonialism. He talks about these NGOs and the World Trade Organizations and the mo mo uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. These are the places they come and get us and we're working for them and we thinking we're doing something for our people. Yes. We ain't doing nothing but supporting neocolonialism. That's right now. I'm sorry, it's got to be like that. I'm not telling you you got to quit your job if you work for one of them. But at least become revolutionary and give us the information we need to be back. Another thing that history tells us is we have, it's time because right now the United States is, is resorting to more militarism because they're not so much a world power. They're competing with like China. China is the main reason they're, they're trying to increase their uh, militarism and a lot of things that they're doing around the world is because they want to compete with China. And we have to be careful about the, the uh, propaganda again because they'll have us always talking about what about China? You know, so I'm not saying we shouldn't be worried about China, but they'll have us talking about that and we ain't even talking about Africa. We're not even talking about the United States is doing it in Africa or, or the militarism in our communities. I almost want to talk, talk about the, the American descendants of slaves, which seems like a digression. But, but it's related. 
Because if we think our history and our heritage started at the Middle Passage, then we don't understand our obligation to fight, fight forces like AFRICOM. We won't understand that the 1033 program and AFRICOM are counterparts. They're counterparts. They're the same thing. We are colonized people right here. We got the same, and it's not an analogy, it's the reality. We got the same relationship in this country to the forces of white supremacy and capitalism and patriarchy as the colonized people do. That's right. Colonization is not about the geographical no, distance. No. It's about the relationship right. of power. Right. We have to be colonized. That's right. And when we start talking about oversight and all that kind of stuff, we ain't never heard no liberation force say, we need a more benevolent <laughs> occupying force. <laughs> And they said, we got to get rid of the occupation. That's right. So, That's right. uh, so one, Pan no, I'm, I'm going to end with this. Pan African Community Action has community control of the police, and it goes in line with the domestic side of our campaign about Africa uh, and overthrowing, getting the U.S. out of Africa and overthrowing um, AFRICOM. And we want, uh, what we want to say is not only does the need there need to be a mass movement in the U.S. to shut down AFRICOM. This mass movement needs to become inseparably, inseparably bound with the movement that has swept this country to end murderous police brutality right. against black and brown people. Yes. The whole world must begin to see AFRICOM and the militarized police departments as counterparts. No compromise, no, no, no retreat, struggle to win. Yes.